the Transportation Advisory Committee meeting of Tuesday, March 20th, 2018 is called to order. Lisa, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Anderson. Here. Mr. David, Mr. Jessick, Mr. Lyman has said he'll be arriving a few minutes late. Mr. LaSalle? Here. Mr. McEnroe? Here. Mr. Mahoney? Here. Mr. Mitchell? Here. <coughs> In the first item, Two, item two is approval of the minutes of January 16th, 2018. Does anybody have any changes, additions, whatever to those minutes? Move down the minutes. Call. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Passed. Do you have a question? I made, no, I made the motion to approve okay. them. Got it. Okay. Agenda analysis. Does anybody have any changes or additions they'd like to make to the agenda analysis this evening? Okay, citizens' comments. It doesn't look like we have very many citizens tonight, so we'll <laughs> move on. Item five, new business discussion items. The tab 2018 goals and bylaws discussion. Did you want me to head that up, or was John going to do it, or what? Do you want Bob to uh, please? Well, I, you know, I think, um, why don't you start, and I'll chime in as needed, but. <clears throat> OK, we, uh, staff, and I and Henry met recently to put these goals together. And um, this very good graph that I hope you all have a copy of. Now, does anybody not have a copy of these TAC goals? I don't have a copy of them. Okay. Oh, thank you. There you go. Okay, um, we just went like we did last year, and we looked at the city commission goals, which is in the upper right part there of this graph, and uh, tried to match up the traffic goals with them. So uh, support the proposed 20 mile an hour speed limit by recommending approval of the speed limit resolution with a five to seven year implementation implementation plan and that matches the city commission goal three I had it here in a minute which is goal three is enhance the livability of the community we also discussed earlier that we didn't want to do like Portland did and do a grand, big grand sweep of the whole city at once. And so that's, that's the five year to seven year implementation plan. The next plan is provide an annual review of the Oregon City Neighborhood Traffic Fact Sheet and engage public in utilizing this document and information contained herein to facilitate traffic safety. Again, that supported the City Commission Goal 3 and also Goal 4, which is pursue opportunities to increase transparency and encourage citizen participation. Bob, before we move on, I have a question. So we had several drafts of that. Can you remind me what the status of that report is? Have we disseminated it to the CIT or um, what? It's now on the website, but we haven't brought it forward yet to the city commission. Okay. So it's in its final format. Um, so it is on the website for people to view. I'm also working on an article for the trail news, um, that's upcoming trail news that will also discuss the neighborhood traffic fact sheet with a link to it so that um, the public can go to it and utilize that information. Great, thank you. And we, and we decided or not to go to the individual neighborhood 
association meetings to present that. I, I know we talked about it, but I don't know that we ended up with any real decision. Um, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. I would have to look at the meeting minutes. To I don't know. think I don't okay. think we made a decision on that. We did make a decision to present it to city commission. Yeah. You wanted to, I think, couple that with, with uh huh, yeah. So we haven't brought it to them yet, but we didn't make a decision on the neighborhood association. Okay. If we wanted the neighborhood associations to get a, to to give us feedback, it might be best to invite all of them at one time to one of our meetings so they can. We can present it to them so we're not, we don't have to go to 97 different places. Yeah. Or it could be presented to the CIC. Yeah, there you go. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, I think, in my opinion, the CIC would be the, the more appropriate. Mm -hmm. It would be hard to get all those chairs here for a TAC meeting, I know. Do you, um, I mean, I, I go to not all those, but some of those. Um, I'm going to miss. Um, I'm actually going to miss April's because I'm going to be at an APWA conference. Um, so is that something you or one of the one of the other members want to come and talk to the CIC about? Because we could get you on the agenda and have a short presentation about it. I could do that. Yeah. Perhaps uh, Martin could sit in on that uh, as a technical support, if that's useful. Okay. The next, <clears throat> the next item is member participation as needed on community advisory committees with work related to Oregon City Transportation with an emphasis on safe routes to school outline an implement, implementation plan for at least one safe route to schools project or grant opportunity, and that matches goal four of the city commission goals. Um, I was going to follow up on that safe route to schools with the Milwaukee School District and I haven't done so yet. I, I still plan to, but I've been pretty much involved in some park place land use issues. I have some information to present on the Safe Routes to School in my report too, so oh, I'll okay. share maybe a better option for you. Oh, okay, good. The next uh, goal would be remain involved in larger developments relating to transportation by tracking projects and providing comments regarding these projects, uh, like the Cove Project, Myers Road Extension, Public Works Operations Center Master Plan, and the Beaver Creek Road Concept Plan, and those are in matching up with four of the goals of the City Commission, goal one, two, three, and five. And the next item <clears throat> is openly listen to citizen requests regarding transportation concerns and that matches their goal for pursue opportunities to increase transparency <coughs> and encourage citizen participation. And I, I like to see the citizens come talk to us most of the time. Very a good question. The previous Don. one where we say projects such as list the cove and several there, um, reading it maybe for the third or fourth time, it seemed to me that we is don't. Your, is your mic turned on? Seemed to me. I don't know, is it? So got, the light should be on. The light's on. The little red light's on. Oh, mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. Um, seems to me that each year, or seems like each year, staff is working on a major grant for a major project. I don't know if that's something that would make sense to carve out and list separately here. Um, funding is huge, and grant cycles dictate a lot of what we do in terms of priorities. So. I'm just wondering, I don't know if we have to list it as an ongoing one and future one. So we're working on the Malala grant right now. And John was reminding me that's 2019, it kicks off or something like that. So it's a bit out, but I don't know. When I read this, um, 
it didn't sound as proactive as I thought it did in the past for road projects, public works road projects. And so I'm just making a suggestion that maybe we could emphasize that a little more. If you go to the facilities section, let's see, that's goal two. For example, in goal two, I don't think any of those specifically deal with roads. Maybe they're not by definition a facility, but they're capital improvements, just like the jail and the public works operations buildings and the like. So I, I don't know. That's just my reaction. And I've read this numerous times. So I'm just thinking that maybe that could be emphasized more. One thing that I, I would hope to be able to get um, support on is any grant application that we bring forward usually requires um, letters of support. Right. So um, maybe the maybe an additional goal could be included that um, uh, or supplemented to this one. Well, I, maybe it's a separate goal, but support um, transportation grant applications brought before the committee with a letter of support. I mean, yeah, that's, it, that kind it, of presumes it, it, that you support the project, <laughs> but <laughs> well, just, maybe just uh, just uh, uh, transportation grant opportunities. Uh, yeah, support back or support or. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think I that don't know how to, how to award a goal, but something that we're, where you would bring the grants and we could talk about it and then give you our support. If it makes sense. Yeah. Can if I may, can I put down? So I put some thought, a thought down, and it might be half baked at this time. But what I've got is advice on grants and street improvement guidelines. I think that's that should kind of. What was the cover. second part? The ad uh, street improvement guidelines. That's different. Yeah, that's 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 so that's basically say you presenting the work plan to us for future work stuff and us saying, yeah, or how about this or that or something else. I think I'd be more specific as far as uh, advice on transportation grants. Works for me. Does that work for you? Sure. Okay. John, did you have anything else? You were mentioning to me a couple things. Was that the only one that you wanted to change in the goals? I think that was the only one for the goal, yes. And, and I think that would, that would work with goal two and goal three. Possibly goal five. We get back to the uh, the duties and responsibilities and authority of the uh, in Article Two of the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee. And that fits right in, but it it gets right back to the the uh, <laughs> ongoing question is. How much authority does this outfit have? <laughs> <laughs> and how much do you want it to have? You know, really? Mm -hmm. Because there's going to come a time one of these days we're going to get to a nitty gritty issue and we're not going to agree with the staff. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> it's, it's, it's advisory, is that, is right? That a, is that a capital never or, or an almost never? <laughs> That's a for sure never. <laughs> well, you know, that, you, you see what I'm getting at, though. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, well, especially if we're talking grants, um, you know, the, the challenge with grants is usually they're f pretty focused, right? So they want to be around, you know, bike and ped, or they want to be around jobs, or uh, fo uh, folks with um, that that maybe need the, tr the public transportation systems a little bit more. So we're finding more and more we kind of have to identify these projects that fit the need of the grant, right? And I guess I'm, there's so much need, there's not very much grant and there's so much need out there that I would, 
I'm sure there's probably a situation where you wouldn't support it, but I guess it'd be nice to have our goal kind of reflect the idea that you're probably going to be more supportive than opposed. Well, I, I just use that as an extreme example. I, I think the committee wants to support anything that you bring bring forth to us, but it gets back to how much authority. Uh, <laughs> it's not much authority. I think we're just, I mean, I think we're just advising, you know, there's a collective body here that has a lot of knowledge that, you know, we could voice our opinion and say, yeah, you know, this looks great, or maybe you should consider doing this. I think the community would support more this than that. You know, every project has its positives and negatives, and not everybody will be happy. But this, these type of projects always advance community and build infrastructure and provide a benefit that, for the most part, we should be able to support it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we sometimes, um, sometimes we go full bore and we get, uh, you know, a bunch of community support and we've, we can get all kinds of groups to do it. But more often than not, we're under an 11th hour effort to kind of get that grant proposal put together. And we're calling out to the CIC, you know, ch chair to say, hey, do you think you'll support? You know, if we draft a letter for you, could we get signatures just so we can get that in the packet, right? Or it's the Oregon City Business Alliance or Chamber. We're doing, that seems to be, I mean, I'd love to say we were more planned than that. And sometimes we are, but sometimes it's like you learn, you know, here's a pretty good grant opportunity and this particular project fits well. It's due, you know, at the end of the week, Friday. So, you know, we, we reach out to Lisa and Martin and whoever else, and let's try and plug in you know, some response to that yeah. application. And, you know, I like to think we're more ahead of it than that, but sometimes we're not. Yeah. So, so we, we hang our hats a little bit on an advisory group that tends to hear from the public and should have a, have its pulse on what the community feels is important enough to, you know, to pursue grant funding for. So a well, question, when you guys are kind of find it like last minute and you're, trying to submit something to it what's your success rate versus where you where you really prepare for it and yeah well like we submitted one uh Clack so clackamas county's been doing some things that are associated with the uh, clackamas county coordinating committee where they know based on an allocation through the state or through metro that they're going to get uh let's say four million dollars right and based on the rest of the region, everybody gets a little piece of that pie. So they try to figure, they're trying to work with the agencies to figure out which projects make the most sense, what's most likely to win across the, the region. And so, uh, you know, we were talking through that. And again, we're both trying to meet a, a grant deadline and we're trying to get it in front of a small group at the county through this county coordinating committee and sometimes all of a sudden those are those timelines just get really really tight and so you know we just did one for them and we we presented main street um between 15th and the cove as a project that needed kind of we need sidewalks along there you know we need to kind of connect that and it was kind of aligned with the kind of project that they were looking for which is bike and ped and uh and it was also about doing some um some of the front end work, right? The engine feasibility, the analysis and the cost estimating for kind of a bigger project. So we took that, our little project, our project turned about to be one of the little ones and it was one of the few that were, that were smaller. And then other agencies, including Clackamas County, Milwaukee and Lake Oswego, they brought forth some much bigger projects that would consume all that money. And they decided to go as a group to go with the bigger projects. So, Sometimes we win some, I mean, and that wasn't really a win. It was really just a, uh, it helped facilitate a conversation about real projects. And the county ended up going with facilitating the project that was um, going to look harder at a pedestrian crossing across the Willamette River between Lake Oswego and Oak Grove. And, you know, after seeing all the projects, it seemed like a good project to, for, the, for the region to look at, right? So that's what they landed on, but you never know. I mean, they're all different. No, I didn't mean like, it seems like when you're, it seems like if you know in advance and you prepare for it, you have better chances of maybe winning the grant versus like when you're just 
yeah. trying to do it last minute. I would say that's true. Um, sometimes we have already prepared, like, uh, if we, like the Holcomb project, it was about four years ago, we put a bunch of energy into creating a Holcomb sidewalk project. So we have that sitting in the lurch and the grant application package may look, look a lot different, but we can take that data, bring it forward, plug it in, spice it up. And, you know, it may not take us more than a couple of days, especially with some of the talent we have in our GIS and mapping group, they can put that together pretty fast for us. Kind of like what you do with with uh, proposals, right? Sometimes you have to put those together pretty quick. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So same thing. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. It, is this sort of like you saying you don't have quite the, a, a, a grant staff writer person on hand? Mm -hmm. We don't. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> we got Lisa. <laughs> Lisa and Martin do the client show that. All right. Okay, the next item of business is the TAC bylaws revisions. <clears throat> Just to remind everybody and, and Mike, bring Mike up to date. In uh, December of 2016, I was reelected as the chair of the TAC. However, that was also the end of my term, which would have caused a little bit of a problem had the mayor decided not to reappoint me. <laughs> in January. And so we, we got to talking about that and we decided, well, there must be something we can do in the bylaws. And so we had a little, a little, very little committee come up with a change. And if you look in the, uh, the uh, bylaws revisions here, we have, well, actually Article 2A, we changed, we eliminated the management plan and replaced it with neighborhood traffic fact sheet, which we, uh, a select group of people put together very effectively. And then the next item is Article 4A, officers and staffing. Uh, nominations and election of new officers shall be taken, shall be taken at the TAC meeting immediately following the mayor's appointment of TAC members and she'll take office the following month. So this will accomplish a couple of things. One, it'll, it'll, our elections will follow the, major, the mayor's uh, appointments in January. However, if, as we have well experienced, the weather prevents meetings and prevents his appointments. We could go from month to month to month as long as we still have our nominations and elections. The, the meeting immediately following the mayor's appointments. So that should solve that problem. It would also help with it was a year or two ago when we had like four or five meetings in a row that we couldn't come to because uh -huh. the weather was blew us out and that was around the election time of officers and the seating of new members and electing new members and yeah. okay the next one is article 5 organizational procedures uh, 5b um, it was that if a quorum was not attained at any one of our meetings the meeting would have to be uh, canceled but we, we thought about that more seriously. And what if we had some citizens that came before us at a meeting to discuss an item on the agenda or any other item not on the agenda, and we canceled the meetings, thus they wouldn't be able to testify. And we thought, in the interest of taking care of the public and their interests, we would eliminate the uh, cancellation. So we crossed out if a quorum is not attained 15 minutes following the scheduled time of, of call to order, the meeting shall be canceled. We eliminated that cancellation altogether. I think that, that this is, yeah, that's, that's good for the, for citizen involvement, but 
when this when the TAC has to, has a vote on something, there needs to be a quorum. Yeah, we would not be able to. Mm -hmm. So we need to address. We've we've then eliminated that requirement to have a quorum. No, no, no. Or is it in there still? It's in, it's still in there. In, in the previ previous sentence under the same line item, it says 51% of the membership shall constitute a quorum. Okay. So you gotta have you got to have a quorum to do business. You don't have to have a quorum to listen to people. It's a, it, well, further on in that same sentence, the concurrence of a majority of the TAC members present, present shall be required to decide any matter. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to. We, if we did not have a quorum, we wouldn't be able to make any decisions. I can tell you, I spoke with the city recorder today, and she thought it was a really good idea to remove this from the bylaws in hopes that other committees and commissions that have this will remove it down the road as well. Because like in some situations, we do have people that might show up a few minutes late. So then we do have a quorum, and we can continue mm. on with a meeting, cool. whereas this here states we would have had to have canceled it. Okay, yeah. hang on a minute. I just read it again, and that isn't what it says. What Are you Ed, about your, Ed, Edward's question, because it says we can meet with less than a quorum, and then it says a majority of the members present shall be required to decide any matter. What it doesn't say is you have to have a quorum in order to decide any matter. Can you keep any oh, minutes okay. without yeah. a quorum? Sure. <clears throat> no, all the quorum mm -hmm. is necessary for is simply to make it an official decision. Mm -hmm. But we, we could change this so we could say something to know that that for the purposes of mm -hmm. you know, I guess hearing public or something, or that the the TAC meeting can occur, but no no decisions can be voted on without having a quorum. I, I think that's what we just put in there. It said it would yeah. say uh, a quorum must be present to to uh, make decisions, decide any matters, make decide any matters. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I like we need that. To add that. So. Mr. Chairman, that's you looking? All, that's all the question. I mean, all the changes we had. Are you looking for a motion to accept these so that they can go on to with the commission? With the revision. Yeah, the revision of a mention of grants and the goals and the revision in the language on the quorum that we just talked about. The move we adopt those are those two changes. Did you get that? You made the motion. Yes. Okay. Second. A quorum must be I second. present to this. Okay. With motion, a second. <clears throat> All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, passed. So, at least if you'll make those those changes, um, do do we want to take another look at these after those changes are made before it's uh, official? <coughs> I, I see no. We have to. We, we have to vote on accepting this. Okay. We just. We just. Or did we just vote we just on? Did that. We, just we just did that. Yeah. Yeah. It's we made it. Okay. With, yeah. with the change that you. Okay. And then it will go before city commission as a resolution, and then they have to approve yeah. it. Yeah. If they don't, it would bounce back to you guys. They make yeah. other revisions and then go back to them. Yeah. So. I would like to thank those of you in the committee who worked on the matrix. That is really useful. So I, I like the way it's laid out, and you can compare with the city goal, so thank you. Or Lisa, she did it. <laughs> I think it was John's idea last year. It was a good idea. Okay, um, so then I guess the next step will be to get it to the city commission. Yes. So we'll do that. Yep. We'll get it in front of him mm -hmm. yeah. again. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm trying to remember. Okay, next what item is 5B, public works here. report. Um, I was going to do that. Okay. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Next item is 5B, the public works report. Right. Um, so if you can pull up OC map and then that, uh, well, I guess it would be the, the graphic first. So let's pull down the screen real quick. Sure. <clears throat> I 
think that thing sounds worse every time I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it <laughs> just pull up the first slide. It needs a grease uh, we'll, job. We'll, 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 it's something. Now we may have to go back. So, um, I was having a little bit of time, time, a little bit of a hard time remembering because we were, this was last, this was an item from our last meeting, but we didn't actually have a meeting, right? So this, we we're going to bring this forward on February. So, and my recollect was, um, we had Dana here maybe December or January to talk through this, uh, 20 more, 20 mile per hour concept. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're still, it's still a work in progress. Um, we're still, uh, internally, we've talked about a couple of ways to implement this, and we haven't um, actually been able to get together as a group to kind of figure out oh, um, how to kind of assess these, these zones. But um, the intent is to use something like this. This is similar to what the city of Portland has done with some signage kind of that identifies that family-friendly route. And we're, our target area for the family-friendly routes, well, the family-friendly routes have already been established, so the target areas that we're looking at uh, are those family-friendly routes, and we would want to utilize a 20-mile-per-hour speed limit in those 20-mile-per-hour areas. There's probably some exceptions to that, but that, especially those that are kind of deeper in the neighborhood, that's what we're talking about trying to do. Now, we, um, we feel like in order to do this in a way that's going to be meaningful and in a way that's going to be effective, we need to kind of take our time and do kind of what I'd call a road audit with those. So look at those family-friendly routes in a lot more detail and figure out maybe where in areas where you're entering a neighborhood, maybe you're doing some kind of either a hard curb extension or a striped curb extension. Maybe you're striping a center lane. Maybe you're looking at street lighting. There's just a lot of criteria that we talked about internally that we'd want to look at when we look at kind of doing a road audit. So, and thinking about just some of the cost that would be involved in re-signing and re-striping some of these neighborhoods. So. You know, we would, we're proposing that we, um, first of all, get this plan in place and, and, and document specifically what we would want to do, um, provide that for the TAC to approve and then the city commission to approve. Um, internally, we talked about getting together and doing, uh, doing a couple of them to see how they would go, see what kind of recommendations would come out of that. And um, using um, Martin and probably our street supervisor and uh, Dana Webb, who's been kind of, kind of trying to move this initiative forward and just trying to really go through each one of those corridors and identify all of those kind of improvements that would be needed in order for that family-friendly designation to be effective. So we're, it's still work in progress. I just kind of wanted to give you a little update on where we're at with that. Um, we think, we think it's, there's a lot of effect. The one thing that I wanted to share, maybe you could flip to the OC map, was just in, um, in OC map, there's a, um, the, and actually through our trend, so zoom in on a neighborhood and then turn on the fam, under uh, transportation planning over there, there's a checkbox and then drop down, and there's a family friendly designation Family-friendly routes. Yeah, family-friendly routes. So these routes come out of our transportation system plan, so they're already designated routes, and it's just really a matter of trying to figure out, again, kind of doing those safety audits to make sure we understand if there are existing sidewalks there. If not, are we talking about um, doing something like was kind of discussed in that Kanema plan where we know we're never probably going to have sidewalks, so what do those markings look like on the pavement? Is that all we're doing? Are we, you know, are we trying to stripe shoulders? Are we actually suggesting in order for this to really be a family-friendly route that we need to add a section or two a sidewalk? You know, what are those improvements that need to happen? And then taking those on over what we think is citywide implementation of seven years, five to seven years to but get that done. Question here, I mean, where does Sandy's don't lead anywhere? 
I mean, you're showing a family friendly route between homes and Warner, but I mean, doesn't connect people to another route if they want to move to the city. Right. So the, the idea, it's my understanding is the idea on those is that they're essentially trying to get you to areas that have facilities with oh. say bike lanes or sidewalks. So yeah, they're not, or, you know, so, and it may be that the mapping and, you know, that came out of the transportation system plan. That was a pretty high level. So does it need to go a little further than homes? Um, or what are we trying to get folks to on Warner street? Is that, I think that's the cemetery at the end of, um, Warner street. So there's a lot of pedestrians that actually use that. So, you know, just trying to evaluate those to really see what makes the most sense for those family friendly routes. But the idea is not to post everything at 20 miles an hour, just post these family friendly routes. I have a, I have a question. If, do you see any value if the TAC were to put together any sort of broad spectrum ideas on what might be appropriate for such a effort or to have the staff and you through you or Martin or some or Dana or somebody come in and and kind of explore with us or tell us you know educate us right so there's um, what Dana's working on is this 20, 20 mile per hour speed limit um, policy mm -hmm. and that's where I think you're gonna see more details we're just it's it's definitely not it's definitely draft right. and we're not really ready to bring it forward so everything from what the pavement markings would look like what the signage would look like what some of the criteria would be that we'd be looking at for doing the safety audit all that would be part of that policy and then you would have it to comment on and and uh, hopefully again support there's no legend john what's the number one thing in a in a neighborhood that would be considered family friendly. Is it the, 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 the speed or is it the pedestrian uh, right away outside of the outside of the road surface, like i.e. sidewalks? If we, is that a family friendly uh, element of the of the concept? Not necessarily just sidewalks because we have a lot of areas designated as family friendly that I don't necessarily think we're ever going to have sidewalks in. So it might be that we eliminate on-street parking or we reduce on-street parking in areas where it's, it's too narrow. Um, you know, we definitely uh, work at traffic calming, so it might be that we decide, well, we need speed cushions or uh, speed bumps in these neighborhoods to make them a little more family-friendly, a little more obvious that way. I definitely think the entrance and the, where you enter, like say, um, I believe it's Boynton off of Warner Parrot there. That might be a good example of a place where you got a lot of traffic coming off of an arterial, turning into a neighborhood. What's the message at that point in time, right? Is there, do we do some kind of a striped curb extension so that, you know, the driver sees something different and they feel all of a sudden, oh, I'm in a different kind of a zone here. I need to slow down, you know. Those, those kinds of things. Well, it happened to me the other day. I turned a corner and I got into a situation where I had so many different stripes on the highway. I didn't know what was going on. And I think it was towards the evening hours, too. And I really got confused. And I said, oh, this is a good place for an accident, you know, with me in it. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm a little bit confused here. We're talking family-friendly routes and, I mean, neighborhoods and this map shows a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of subdivisions here. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't they be family-friendly routes? You know, what's the criteria here? I mean, what? I mean, I'm looking, especially in this newer, newer part of part of the city that that been developed. I mean, those should have facilities. They should be all, you know, family-friendly routes. If somebody's going through those neighborhoods, I think those be posted at 20 miles. I think some of them are, but I, we just don't want to post it citywide, 20 miles per hour, just because it's a residential street. So we're trying to- Why is it we don't want to do that? Well, enforcement. Nobody's going to enforce that. That's, I mean- to and be signs cost money. To be, uh, I mean, to me, to be frank about this is that 
I think that many of these streets shouldn't be driven at 25 miles per hour, but we're talking about making an obvious point about this is an area where people maybe go from one neighborhood to another. Maybe they're trying to get from their home to a park and trying to make that a little bit more safe than what it is today. Without, yeah, without trying to provide striping for every residential street, without trying to eliminate parking. I mean, it's not just about signage, it could be about street lighting, whereas a lot, of, a lot of the older, well, the newer neighborhoods should be well illuminated, right? But some of the older neighborhoods like Boynton and um, I'm just thinking of, I want to say Barker, some of those, there's still, you know, lighting is on the PG poles that are, you know, several hundred feet apart. And, you know, maybe the, the audit would show to really make this a family friendly street, you need better street lighting. And maybe instead of just leaving it because there's no curbs in that particular neighborhood, you know, maybe the recommendation is, yeah, you need some curbs and sidewalks, or I think more likely it's going to be, we need to, um, designate through striping where the travel zone is and maybe hopefully there's enough room for a, a, a walking area and then find the pavement legends that identify those areas so families with dogs or strollers or whatever they want to do tend to focus on those areas and the driver that tends to recognize that that's something that they need to be more alert about but then what about all the future developments i mean if if we're talking family friendly neighborhoods routes, all that stuff, why don't we then work towards having new standards that implement these? So when these new neighborhoods are constructed, you have that curb return, you have all these things that, you know, you have new speed signs that are supposed to 20 miles. I mean, I, I understand cost and, and, that, and that's a, a big and important thing, but, you know, we should be then thinking about the future and set the policies that don't construct neighborhoods that you can drive 25, 30 miles through. So I am, I guess I'm describing more the, the existing development, but you're right about new development. That those family routes exist on new development streets too. And uh, in fact, the Beaver Creek concept plan has got those, those kinds of routes, for instance, laid out already. So we do, we are, it is our goal to require the developer to build a street that's more family friendly in those areas. I guess what I've been kind of thinking about when we're talking about road audits are our existing neighborhoods. So. No, I, I, I get it. I was just, when we're on this topic, I was just hoping yep. that, you know, we got old stuff and we can't correct it all, uh, you know, that easily, but anything new that we build, we should focus those, you know, have those developments with that in mind. Yeah, I agree with that. So we built new communities that are family friendly, that people could feel safe, that kids can play in the street, people could bike, you know, and people aren't just driving 45 miles an hour for the neighborhood. Right. You know, calming devices and those things. Yep, I built agree. In. Our, our family, family, uh, family friendly streets, uh, is that something now that in the new subdivisions that are coming before the planning commission, mm -hmm. that that's one of the requirements that the builder has to have a family friendly route through their new subdivision? Because they're seeing some pretty good sized subdivisions these days. Yeah. What we haven't established is signing and striping specific for those, but they're typically including more of the curb extensions, the wider sidewalks, those kinds of facilities. If they're designated as having a regional trail through those neighborhoods, they're required to build those. So I, I do feel like it's moving in that direction for the new, new subdivisions. And I do believe, based on our design standards today, the new subdivisions feel very family friendly, right? You can walk in a neighborhood and feel friendly, unless it's a infill that's facing an existing, you know, uh, arterial or collector. But well, I was going to mention that too, is that my experience is the same as you just mentioned, is the new developments have a 
family friendly feel to them, just the way the sidewalks were built back and and uh, it just feels more like a 25 mile an hour zone. Whereas you get in some of the older parts of the city, maybe they don't have sidewalks. Um, just the feel, general feel of it, thinks, well, I can go 25 or over 25 miles an hour comfortably. <clears throat> Yeah. So now, but would this family-friendly um, project tie in with the safe routes to schools? Would, would they mesh with each other, or how would that work? Well, I mean, we don't have designated safe routes to schools in Oregon City. Yeah. So the idea with these family-friendly routes is that they are the kind of the natural corridor for where pedestrians and folks could walk and feel safer. And in theory, they get as close to the schools. Some of our schools, though, are on places like South End Road and Gaffney Lane that, you know, may not have been identified as family-friendly routes because of the kind of boulevard they are. Okay. Would this require any modification to our subdivision regulations? Or do we just evaluate them as, as they come along and apply sort of a overlay criteria to a... Well, our standard would be to, when we, when we see a subdivision piece of property come in, we start flipping these various layers on, whether it be uh, a family-friendly route or a sewer master plan improvement area. We mm -hmm. start flipping those layers on and we start identifying those things that the developer needs to build for us, right? Or include in their in their plan. And that's how those conditions of approval come about. So family friendly would be one of those conditions. So they would have the force of law behind it? Sure. Yeah. They would? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Land through the land use approval process, you know. Sometimes it makes a lot of sense. Other times it's kind of like, well, this has only got one property frontage and everybody a mile in each direction doesn't have that. So yeah. should we require it there? Yeah. Um, you know, typically if it's designated family friendly, the answer would be yes. Right? Make that improvement now so that, you know, if it, whether it's a city project or another redevelopment project that's just down the street, they all kind of incorporate those, those concepts. You know, we're sitting there as a planning commission. <laughs> we're we're just getting bat blasted on this quasi judicial process. I mean, because you're looking out there, and half the people you see in are attorneys, <laughs> and then engineers, and planners, and once in a while you see a neighborhood advocate. And when well, you did it for this guy, but you don't, you're not requiring it for that guy. So you're not applying the, the law uniformly without prejudice, that kind of stuff. We're sitting there scratching our head. <laughs> what the heck did he just say? <laughs> well, we'll find out at the Supreme Court or Luba. That's where we'll find out. So when I hear you put forth these suggestions, which I think is fine, I think it's great. I'm wondering in the back of my mind, just how we're gonna approach that and put it into a motion that'll carry the day at the planning commission level when you hear these things. You know, 20 years ago, you just put it into a motion. Today, you, know, you gotta write a constitution, <laughs> you know, really, because it's gonna go to Luba. Here comes Oregon City again. <laughs> really, we're getting, that, we're getting that reputation. I don't know how many appeals we have pending before Luba now. It's, it's so, you know, uh, I, I just, how to implement it, how to enforce it so that it has the force of law, you know, without going, getting crazy about it, you know, because you can get crazy over this stuff. You really can. Well, I mean, for us, it's, is it in the transportation system plan? Do we have uh, an adopted policy? Those things, you know, matter. They do. Right. Yeah. If we don't, um, 
then it's harder. Well, I think the staff does a great job of giving the staff reports like this, you know, 500 pages. And, and I recognize it's just for the record, you know, to get something on on the record that we we did our due diligence, you know, which I think is fine, too. But it's getting more and more complicated, John. <laughs> I don't think I grabbed it. So, sounds this like life in general. It's got a little <laughs> notes. Right. Yeah, exactly. I'm afraid to say good morning. So, again, we haven't finished this. I just feel like we've talked about it and we said we're going to get it to you. We're just struggling a little bit to get there. So we'll have something in front of you eventually that you'll be able to approve but um, or not approve. John, as, as you do the audit, can you can you uh, can you get a twofer out of this? OK, are you doing other types of audits that you're going to have to do anyway? Uh, updating throughout the city can you do those audits on these streets at the same uh, same time as you do the family friendly audit well um yes and no thanks martin um i mean I, you know right now our street department has a sign audit program where they they look at a particular area and they focus their kind of uh observations on those particular issues they do the same thing with like tree trimming, right? So they <laughs> they don't do all that at once. It's really a lot. I mean, it gets it can get kind of complicated. And I think with these road safety audits, the focus is going to be mostly on road safety, right? And thinking about illumination at, during the day. Uh, I mean, at nighttime, you know, signage. Is there site obstructions? You know, really trying to make recommendations for that corridor that they can then pursue with the, the property owners that they want on, or pursue on our own in, in terms of improvements in the public right of way. But, um, you know, I just think even even with a small group of folks like that, if they're trying to focus on, um, <laughs> you know, too many things, you probably will lose sight of you know, your main focus, which is a road safety audit. You got to be effective before you can be efficient. Yeah. And I mean, I, okay. you know, I think it's a comprehensive look. It's just probably not going to look at drainage improvements while we're looking at road safety problems. And, and certainly you got to have some, some standards to grade against before you can make a judgment. Yeah. That's kind of why we want to try a couple of them just to make sure we're all on the same page and we think those kinds of criteria are important. I, I know that, I don't know if you guys are doing much of that, how much of the ADA assessment uh, with all those new requirements, but maybe at that time, I mean, you're looking crossings and stuff, you could be also looking at the streets potentially. I definitely think that's one of those items. Is it ADA, you know, if we've got sidewalks, are they ADA compliant? And if they're not, then that should be part of the road safety audit. So yeah. that that particular item is one that I think would definitely be included in that road safety audit. Because you're right. Right now, again, like I mentioned before, we don't have a comprehensive ADA um, evaluation plan. So this could help facilitate some of that. Yeah, I mean, you're joining forces. Okay, enough on the 20 mile per hour one, or is there more questions about that? I, one more comment. Okay. The areas that that bother me, to, kind of to what Bob said, that the newer subdivisions, they do have side, they do have curbs and sidewalks. And, and so they are more, in that respect, are more family friendly. But we're bringing in a huge number of R6 subdivisions the houses are closer together. There's, we have a shortage of park space. The kids are playing in the street. Typically, it, it not, not all the time, but a lot of times there'll be a constrained street and there's parking on one side and what's left is narrow and the kids have the basketball hoop in the street. So to me, it's not just, I think we shouldn't be looking just at a family friendly route on the sidewalk, but we got to realize the way that street is getting used and we don't want the kids playing in the street, but that, that, that's all there is. So 25 miles an hour through an R6 subdivision is too darn fast. 
to me. The houses are too close together. There's too many curb cuts. Um, I think, like, if you look down in the bottom left corner of this map around Partlow Road, it, yeah, anyway, I, I don't know exactly how I'm trying to say what I'm, what I'm thinking, but there's, there's more to it than just because there's a sidewalk, we don't have to worry about the 25 mile an hour speed. Mm -hmm. Because those, there, there's just so much going on in an R6 subdivision, so close together, people out backing out of driveways and kids and the skateboard and you know, all of that. So anyway, that's it. Well, I think I can add to that is that <clears throat> you can go down to R5 and R3.5. Um, those are all zones that really are not conducive to 25 miles an hour. Right. We have to put up signs anyway in those as they're developed. So we're not gonna be spending any more money on signs. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, a zero or a five costs the same <laughs> amount of money on a sign. Mm. So I think the consideration of zoning should also be part of the factor. Yeah, well, to be honest with you, most of our neighborhoods, we don't sign with speed limits signs, right? Most of our newer neighborhoods, they're designated sure. 25 miles an hour, and people don't usually travel that fast on them because they're so tight, right? We've got most of our neighborhoods, we've got on-street parking on both sides, and we've got travel lanes in both directions, and they're 32 feet wide. So really, if you've got a car parked on both sides of the street, you've got 16 feet, and 16 feet, even for your... Um, most uh, aggressive driver is not a lot of room to, so they drop, people tend to drive slower in those. And I, I, I'm sure there's exceptions where there's some kid in the neighborhood when there's nobody parked on the street that goes flying down the street. But, um, you mean we don't put up 25 mile an hour signs of the new developments? Most of them not mm -hmm. really. We're putting them in, we're putting them on the major or the collectors, collectors you know. Well, then they must be putting them up as a demand from the public in certain areas. Well, why, why do we have a 25 mile an hour sign on Oak Tree Terrace? Well, because Oak Tree Terrace is more of a collector. But I mean, if you look at, if you look at some of the uh, side streets in, off of Oak Tree Terrace, they're not. Oak Tree Terrace doesn't go anywhere. How could it, it be carries, a collector? It carries all that traffic that's down in the bottom of that canyon. Yeah. Okay. I just, it doesn't, I can't envision that street being a collector. I mean, it goes down and around and comes back up. There's a lot of homes down there, though. Yeah. So, and. Well, whatever you've des designated, I, I suppose it's right. But. I don't even know if it's designated collector, but I think typically we're um, less likely to post you know, all those little individuals, neighborhood streets for 25 miles an hour, we might hit, you know, a through street like Partlow or um, I'm just I'm trying to think of some of the other streets that might be Gaffney Lane, for instance, or Claremont. Claremont's posted, but all the little side streets off of Claremont, no, not posted with mileage. So I, this is interesting because I was driving, my office is down off the Macadam and those neighborhoods just off the McAdam. I was driving and just today or yesterday, I saw a guy posting a bunch of smart, uh, 20, mile per, uh, 20 miles per hour speed sign. They're not like official signs, but they're just like a little thing you put along the road and- Slow down in my slow neighborhood kind of thing. Well, it's, it's like some sort of Portland neighborhood association and they got this thing going on, talking about 20 miles per hour and you know, be advised, you know, something like that. Maybe I'll take the picture and send it to you. I saw it for the first time, but they're actively putting it throughout the neighborhood to make people aware that they should drive more carefully. So, yeah, so something Port like what I've got on my fence. Portland's taking that on in a lot bigger way. I think they've got uh, areas that are citywide 20 miles per hour. I don't think they're signing them other than those kinds of signs. <coughs> But how does the public know, I guess, um, if you don't, I guess, on these routes you will put signs? Yeah, on these routes we'll put signage. Okay. And we won't necessarily, um, 
It's not like on all the side streets we're going to start posting them with, well, this one's 20 and these are 25, because they're not posted right now, right? They're, they're very so can you, can you technically go off this designated route to a side street, and then you go from 20 to 25? That's technically, yes. It's like technically you can drive in that neighborhood at 25. Okay. John, in a subdivision, um, I take it we don't require the developer to provide any signage. The city is responsible for that. Is that? No, there usually is requirements for signage in new subdivisions. For speed signage? If, well, it may not be speed signage. Um, it, 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 every depends on the subdivision, right? Larger subdivisions, there might be requirements for speed signage if it's got, you know, more of a collector kind of street through it. But other than that, it's usually, you know, no parking signage if there is an area where there's no parking. There may not be a much signage in some yeah. neighborhoods just because there's, you know, need, no need for it. So the signage isn't treated the same way as a utility is where the developer has to install that to, to your standards, to the city standards. No, I'm just, I'm saying they do have to install signs when signs are called for. Mm. It could but, be a, but we don't have a standard that says you're going to sign 25 mile an hour speed limit signs everywhere in the neighborhood on every street. That's, that's not a standard that we have. It could be brought forward as a condition of approval for a developer. Say that again. It could be brought forward as a condition of approval for a developer. To do what? Post 25 miles. Post mile 25 or 20. On every street? Or, or a speed hump. Yeah, we wouldn't. Not every street, but just with within us. their development somewhere at the beginning or the end of the development or. Yeah, typically those signage requirements aren't included as conditions of approval. What's <clears throat> typically required is that they follow our design standards. And our design standards, they, they have never, and nor are we suggesting they include posting signage for every street in the neighborhood or Bob I don't think we've had this conversation before but it's a good one so it's the best practice it, as most cities look at it is you don't sign every residential street that's, that's right typical, so you're typical in how you approach signage for or lack of signage in a typical residential street I'm getting feedback here, but we'll say that again for me, John. So Oregon City is typical it's in tiny. its practice of not signing every residential street. Right. That's typical for Oregon City. It's typical for most jurisdictions. Right. Yeah. Is it one word? Are we going to pull up the street here? It's yeah, I just, tiny. I thought it'd be useful. Right I know, now. it's so hard to navigate. Why is it you got to click in there and zoom. Yeah. Are you keeping up, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> Where'd it go? Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> what just happened here? <laughs> so, anybody heard any good jokes lately while we're waiting? <laughs> <laughs> No, Unfortunately, any yeah, of my not even I don't dare repeat. Uh, oh, you zoomed out really far. <laughs> no, it's whatever street you told it to find. Oak Tree. Let's see. And so we've gone to Oregon City, and we're now. It was over on West. Went to Lake Oswego, <laughs> and now we're back in Oregon City. Yeah. That's right. We're doing. Well, I'm tired of all this traveling. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let's go check the weather report of Bend. Let's get a picture of Bend up here. <laughs> all right. So here's Bob's neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's right. Along Oak Tree Terrace here, and I can't confirm because we just made a map change on the, the GIS system and I can't get into my account. Um, so Oak Tree Terrace is basically serving almost as a collector. Okay, All of these little side streets are all using Oak Tree Terrace to get out to Holcomb. Holcomb obviously would be signed. Oak Tree Terrace more than likely has a couple 25 mile an hour speed signs on. I'm guessing near yeah. Holcomb, right? Yeah. Hudson Bay Way, Whitkey Court, 
even Oakview Drive, a lot of those roads we would not sign with a speed sign. Yeah. Within a residential neighborhood, it's a safe assumption that all of the drivers realize this residential area, standard 25 mile an hour speed limit applies. We could not keep up with the sheer number of signs that would have to be installed, maintained, and subsequently replaced if we had to sign every residential street in this city with the appropriate speed signage. So I'd, be, I'd be surprised if, say, off Holcomb Winston Drive, mm -hmm. I, I'd be, I, I mean, again, we can, we can look, but I'm pretty sure we don't have speed limit signs on Winston Drive Go to into that entire neighborhood back in there. Now, Barlow Drive might have signs. It's a little bit more like a through street with more of a neighborhood collector. I don't know, it's hard to see. Well, my, there we go. the reason I brought that up, my, my question was, would you, in response to citizen concerns, put up a 25 mile an hour speed sign? Because the 25 mile per hour sign there on Oak Tree Terrace is just south of Hudson Bay Way. So facing north, facing north, that's the only one I know of. Mm -hmm. in there. I'm, I was just wondering why that sign is even there. I mean, I don't object to it in being there. In some instances, if we get a request, we'll evaluate it and determine if it's warranted. Yeah, okay. Um, the best example that I can give you that I can recall off the top of my head, we had some signage discrepancies that were brought up on First Street, which is a collector it's in an industrial area. It's not the perfect example, but we went out and did an audit, um, found out that the speed signs there were in an inappropriate locations and made adjustments on that. Yeah, I remember when that was brought up here. Yeah. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head of any instances where we've had a request from a residential neighborhood saying we need a 25 mile an hour speed sign posted out there. Because again, in most instances, You've got some sort of central road that's you know, serving as a collector. It may not be classified as a collector, but it's kind of serving as that, that all of these other smaller residential roads feed into. And wherever that does collect, connect into a truly classified um, collector or minor arterial, there's a sign as you're coming in or out of those areas that tells you this is a speed change here. So I can... I mean... <laughs> We have the ability to, to, to actually drive through these with, you know, virtually, if you will. But, yeah, I mean, this wasn't, this isn't necessarily about re-signing citywide and reposting citywide 20 mile per hour signage throughout. I'm convinced if we did that, nobody will follow any of those signs. They'll become visual clutter that nobody will follow. And... You know, I'm, my hope is that with our approach to the um, family-friendly streets that we'll actually get police enforcement on those. But if we stay 20 miles per hour all over, all over Oregon City, and we've already heard from police, even, even on our program, we're going to have to do some conversing with them about enforcement. You know, I think what you guys are doing is a great idea. I, I just, when I was looking at that map and showing those routes, I just kind of hope that there's more of them leading, you know, taking people either from that neighborhood to a park or taking them to a grocery store or taking them to a theater or taking them to a restaurant somewhere. So you establish these routes for the city where people can feel safe. Okay, I can go to Fred Meyer, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what I think about the, the safe routes and that sort of thing. It doesn't show that many here, only few. and. When you look, some of them, they don't really lead yeah, you. Yeah, all the way, right. Okay. So I, I hear not enough family-friendly routes. No, I don't <laughs> think that's what he's saying. I think he's saying that, that they're, are they in the right place, okay? Going the family-friendly route it must have a purpose, which is to be safe when I go from A to B. So where's A and where's B? I think that's what yeah. needs to be more, just more uh, defined. Where's A and where's B? 
So, John, I think when you do the audit, you can define where A, B, and maybe F are, and they're all tied together. Yes. So, maybe one of the first things is to say, where do people want to go and work from there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's. I mean, what's the focal point in a, in, in a community where people want to go and then get them there, get them out of the car, get them to walk, bike, whatever alternative means are to getting there. Yeah. Instead of sitting in a car and driving to that Fred Meyer, versus because they don't feel safe getting there. Tell, tell you what, I'll offer to take you up to some of these places and dump you on the street and let you walk to Fred Meyer. <laughs> No, I get it. I just think it's in some locations what you don't see is where there's existing safe corridors. Yeah. Right. But then, but those. Do, I mean, I think if you're going to have and you guys have a such a great platform, right? This OC map. Most people can get onto it. Most, you know, if you're going to reach out to community and say, "Hey, we got this program. We got, you know, we're going to establish these routes. There's already existing routes. Show them all there." So. There's the ones that you're planning to work on, and there's the ones that are already kind of existing there. So, so you could show this futuristic plan that at some point people will be able to move to the city and go places. Okay, I I hear you. I I think my problem today is that we're not showing you a clear enough picture of those routes that exist today. Okay. And maybe we need to do a better job of sharing that information so we'll we'll work on that okay sorry for taking too long to discuss no that's good it's good conversation that's actually that was one of the bigger topics these other ones i'm going to go through in pretty short order if i can um 12th and washington signalization project i um just a couple things. So that project bid, we've um, we got bids for that from Brown Contracting. So they've been awarded. They were awarded that project in December of 2017. It's a 220-day contract, and we had a pre-construction meeting in January of January 9th of 18. This the, there's a couple of things. One is signals take a fair amount of time to manufacture and deliver. So um, the signal lead time in the schedule was 112 days, and I'm not quite sure where that puts us today. But one of the main problems we're having right now is all the utilities, overhead utilities, in that intersection need to be raised. They're too low to get. Uh, right now they are in conflict with where our signal heads and signal arms would be, and the, you know the street lighting that will come with that signal. So. Um, we've been talking to PGE for a long time. The problem that they have is that they have a crossing that runs down 12th Street that crosses Union Pacific, and it turned out that they didn't have, that was never a permitted crossing. So Union Pacific is um, requiring them to step through some hoops to get that improved. And they, um, we got some decent news recently. They'd been struggling to even get Union Pacific to respond to PGE. But we heard recently that that's improved. So um, we're hoping to, we still don't have a schedule from them as to when they're going to move that up. It's a significant change with um, 12th and Washington, if you've ever spent any time walking that corridor, is, um, is loaded with overhead utilities. And um, so getting PGE, so they're, they're, they're going to put extra tall poles, um, power poles, power poles, if you will, to replace the ones that are there now, and they're going to move some of them away from that intersection as well. And John, once they get all the power up, then all the other utilities have to come along and move theirs up to get them out of that way. Are we billed back their expenses for that? Uh, they're required to do that on at their expense. Oh, okay. Yeah. We pay for the signal, though, and all the signal improvements, and that's that's an area where uh, the the ramps at 12th, 12th, the ADA ramps at 12th and Washington have been updated uh, at least once, mm -hmm. and they're going to get it again because we just just because of where we're having to put the ped buttons and the um, new signal poles. So 
that's going to be a, pretty much a complete redo of the corners as well as the signal. So, um, so anyway, that project's still moving in the right direction. It's just um, it's got this this overhead power line conflict. So let's go back to the let's turn off OC map and go back. Let's hit the next slide, I think. So this is probably going to be too small for you to read, but um, just giving you a little bit of information on TriMet's enhanced transit corridor discussion and. Um, there's uh, also a memo through Metro. So Metro, there's a couple things going on here. One is there's some busing, bus route changes, service improvements that um, show up on this map and uh, are described. I had them highlighted the other day and now I'm not. I think Highway, or Line 32 is uh, an improved route for us. They're doing some additional frequency of service there. Line, uh, Line X and W are additional lines. Um, what else was there? 79, there's an increase in service there. So quite a few increases in bus service that um, are planned. Some of our, some of our, them are already being implemented by TriMet. So this is just kind of informative to keep you um, understanding what some of those changes are. But the other piece was just this information that was included in your packet, the enhanced uh, transit concept um, plan, TriMet and Metro and um, ODOT and each of the agencies are uh, meaning to talk to key routes that TriMet has identified as service that's not moving quite quick enough. So um, the 30, uh, I want to say it's 33, 33 line. 33, yeah. Um, is one that they've spent a fair amount of time looking at. Obviously, it's pretty slow on Main Street, just moving from one end of Main Street to the other. They'd, they'd really like to see that improved, although that's a tough area to improve. But as it comes up to the top of the hill uh, along High Street, we've been talking to them about some transit uh, stop elimination and some improvements to bus stops. So right now there's a stop at 1st Street on High Street, and there's also one at 3rd Street on High Street and another one on 5th Street. And, and it also kind of goes up uh, 5th Street, and there's quite a few stops along there. So we've been talking about condensing those with them, creating better facilities, for instance, at 3rd and High, when we do our PMUF project, we want to do a curb extension there and make that a better stop so um, that, um, but, but also eliminate the stop at 1st and High Street so that the transit moves a little quicker. We've got maybe a little better facility there for the, the stop and they're really, they're looking pretty hard at ridership and whether there's lift service needed there and really trying to kind of dial in on how important that, you know, some of those stops really are. So we're working through that with them on that and just, um, there's not, I don't have specific information to share with you, but just wanted you to know that effort was underway. Let's go to the next one, here we go. So um, you've seen so many slides on the alternate mobility target discussion. I've only included one from a PowerPoint here just to remind you that this process is still underway. I think next Monday, the Planning Commission hopefully will have their last hearing on that and approve that. Um, Bob, we're, we're hoping for your vote of support on that particular project. I think it's been tripping up over Something that's kind of weird, it had to do with uh, Goal 5 and, um, and water quality, which was kind of a weird thing for yeah, that to trip up. Capital over. W. Um, <laughs> what was that? Capital W, weird. Yeah. Um, so anyway, st nothing's really changed with the alternate mobility. It just keeps moving through. Once we get to Planning Commission, I'll go to the Seed Commission, and uh, then on to the state. I think we're looking at an appeal. Probably looking at an appeal.
I hate to say it. Um, this one here is more related to just kind of some of the stuff that's going on with the region still and our Clackamas County Coordinating Committee, who's really pretty focused on the regional transportation plan update. Well, in Oregon City, there's several projects, which I've shown on the map here. Don't ask me too many details because I don't remember the details, but everything in color is, um, is in our regional transportation plan list as needing to be enhanced with uh, you know larger scale projects that would improve traffic flow. And these are projects that definitely would compete regionally for uh, funding if uh, we wanted to pursue a, a grant. So, I mean, again, um, nobody here attends the C4 meetings that I've ever seen. They're, those are monthly meetings. There's usually a C4 meeting, and then there's also a Metro uh, C4 meeting, which is the Metro agencies. Um, kind of a weird meeting. They're talk, they talk a little bit about everything at that meeting, whether it be transportation. Right now they're pretty focused on housing. They're talking about equitable housing. It's... Um, I'm not sure how effective that group is other than people getting as a big group of people from inside cities and outside the cities. But um, this has been on their agenda. So uh, just and it's been on everybody's agenda because the transportation um, regional transportation plan is being updated. And um, that's a pretty big effort by Metro staff mostly. But all the cities provide input into that. And so um, we've been working with them on getting them our, making sure our list is consistent with what, what uh, with our transportation system plan and consistent with our ability to, to actually generate revenues to pay for some of these projects. Um, Myers, uh, this isn't the Myers Road slide, but uh, Myers Road is the next item on the list. So Myers Road is still on the plans. We still have high hopes to be able to be building something in the spring of 2019. Right now we're working, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, we're working with um, BPA because we've got a conflict between the BPA power lines that run through that alignment and our road alignment. So. There's not enough ground clearance, according to BPA, between some of their highest their highest voltage lines in that run and our road surface. So um, right now they're looking at engineering solutions that might um, help facilitate our roadway with something other than changing our road grade because we don't have we don't we really don't have grade to make that kind of adjustment. So it's more likely their power lines are going to have to go up or they're going to have to change the type of power lines through there. So. It could be costly, but we're working with them on that. John, some of these figures here, are we, are we pricing ourselves right out of business when it comes to building roads and maintaining them? We're going to have to, we're going to, have to do something. <laughs> these are just astronomical costs. Yeah, this slide actually went along with that last slide. So these are just some of the... Um, projects in our project list and my recollect is we've got nine projects 35 projects totaled in the RTP and then these these projects in the graph here represent some of the things that are listed in our um, let me remember that yeah these are our, all RTP funded projects so yeah they're they're expensive they're um, it's a it's a aspirational list. How's that? Roads have never been cheap. Yeah, we got we opened bids today for I don't know if you saw that. I saw that. We opened yeah. bids for uh, a storm pipe on storm 15th project. Fifteenth Street stormwater improvements. Yeah, and you know the estimate was like three hundred sixty thousand. Sedimer, I don't know if you're seeing the same kind of thing, but the low bid was four seventy. Yeah. There's quite a bit there's, more money. There's, there's not enough contractors. They're just throwing numbers right now. They don't. They, they really don't even. They know that they can get <laughs> the, the price whatever. I mean, whatever they put in there. Yeah. I mean, you like that project. I mean, that that you should like. Uh, Tony was telling me that 
the only way that they, they're seeing some reasonable numbers is if you can uh, push the construction in the winter. When they yeah. don't have much going on and they're, then they're willing to sharpen their pencil. But right now, summer, they're just, everybody's asking for employees and they can't find them. There's not, there, there's not enough iron out there either. So that doesn't help these kind of numbers, but shovel. it's, you're right. I mean, roads, we've, we probably often undershoot that, but it, they still look like very big numbers. I mean, 200 million, <laughs> that's over a long period of time. But, and that includes federal funding, state funding, local funding. You go down to L.A. and that'd be just a block or a, or a mile. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the way we cover that is, um, is another little piece of information that I wanted to share with you. So we had been pursuing the, a variety of changes with our transportation system development charges. And again, we brought this before you folks before, but the commission first adopted a new project list and that project list is most of our capacity improvement or all of our capacity improvement projects in total. Um, so we've, it's given us a little more flexibility. So if a developer comes in and wants to build a particular project and it's on our project list, we can probably find a way to um, participate in that project so that it might help that development go along and also get our project built. So we did that. We did some code changes. Um, for the most part, they're, um, they um, are helpful for the development community in that they, um, they give them a longer period of time to kind of look back at what might have been on that lot years ago. So that's there. Um, we've, I'm trying to remember, we included, um, so we've always had a discounted area for the Malala corridor, the Seventh Street corridor, and the mixed-use downtown corridor, but it didn't include the um, Willamette Falls project. So we've included that, so that if any development in there would have a 10% discount, is how it's listed. Um, so we made those kind of changes, but we also looked pretty hard at our project list, did new estimates, looked at growth throughout the planning horizon. And we ended up, one of, the, one of the things that was recommended through the chamber and through the business community was that, hey, you know, we've got lots of residential development going on in town, but we don't have much commercial development in town. And our commercial SDCs were, when we compared them to other agencies, our commercial SDCs are quite a bit higher than other agencies. But yet the residentials kind of, we hit kind of right in the middle of, of what other agencies are doing. So we utilized um, a way to break out some of these bicycle and pedestrian projects because um, we've got a lot of those on the books on our, in our TSP. And we said, well, which ones apply to more of the commercial areas and which ones apply to the residential areas? And we broke those project costs out. And what it means is, I'll use this pointer here so you might have to turn around, but this chart reflects um, what we had before is in this block here. So it's really, we had a vehicle trip or vehicle um, SDC, a bike pet SDC, and then the total. And we had it, oh, we've got it for all kinds, but this is just showing residential. So single family manufactured home, like a mobile home park or uh, duplex townhomes and multifamily. So these are just different rates for transportation SDCs. And before our single family residential transportation SDC was $9,524. And under the new plan that will be effective July 1, um, that new number will go to $10,512 for a single family home for an SDC. On the commercial side, some most of the commercial rates drop slightly, but this increases. So, um, you know, if you're in the market for a new new residential unit, you're going to pay more. There's a kind of flip side to that is we're getting a lot of pushback from neighborhoods about frustration with all the residential development and the impacts of that. So I don't think this is necessarily going to slow down development much, but it's at least going to collect a little more money from them for. Yeah, this um, doesn't dis discourage development, you know, like 
when the city of Gresham was looking at Pleasant Valley, the total SDCs were $65,000 for house, for house combined for everything, the sewer, water. Now they scale that back because it was just making those houses way too expensive. How do we justify low income housing with those kind of figures? Well, that's a challenge. That's the challenge. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Are I mean, we talking out of both sides of our mouth here. Well, I think um, some are, some aren't. Some aren't really sure what to do with low-income housing. They're not necessarily willing to subsidize it through these kinds of figures. Now, there's maybe there's another way to do that. It's but, a, you know, it's I a mean, regional issue, though. It's, it's not a local issue. It's it's something has to be resolved at the regional, statewide, even national. I mean, it's hits every community in in all fifty. Yeah, and you know, I mean, there are fifty, aren't there? Places that are desirable, yeah. like yeah. Uh, the West Coast, um, in several territories. That's probably why we're not seeing a lot of equitable housing. Yeah. Did these take effect immediately? No, they take effect in July one. I have a quick question: Is there a report that we could get a copy of? Yes. And if so, is it a long or relatively short executive summary? It's not too bad. It's not too bad. I would appreciate getting a copy of the new SDC fine. It's online. It's online. We've got it uh, online, John, right now. I, um, maybe can you look? I think it, if you just do a search on transportation SDCs, we've got a nice web page for that, John. That's pretty detailed. Okay. Thank you. This is these sheets here are meant for the development community. So we want to get this this information out so that folks that maybe are in a position to apply early, they'll get the old rate. And um, so just trying to make sure all the builders know this. So these are a couple of items that uh, we put together for. It would be nice if you had here, like how does this compare, like average SDC rate in the metro area or something? So that. Um, Public works, transportation, SDCs. So you can just go right into our webpage. Um, and just type in transportation SDCs and we'll bring you the update. And in in there, in in the uh, the report that... Actually, um, there is comparison. Probably. Yeah, yeah, we've got good comparisons for that. I would say, you know, if you want to know about SDCs, our web page is pretty informed because we've had a couple years of meetings and forums and discussions on SDCs, so um, it's pretty robust, better than I've seen on others. Were there any other SDC charges changed? Not yet. So John's got them on the wall there, but I printed out a copy for you guys probably want to take these home with you because they're so funny. Is um, the annual publication that we started putting out, I think this is the third year you've done this? Yeah. So it's basically the what to what, who's who of construction for public works this summer. It's the capital programs as well as the maintenance work, and it's all broken out for you. To give you an idea Thank of you. what your tax dollars are doing for this summer in terms of major construction projects. Um, the first of these is actually getting ready to kick off fairly soon, um, which will be, uh, I think High Street Water Main will be the first of the big ones that will be um, actually taking new construction. Um, and then, well, actually, no, 15th Street Stormwater will go to construction first. Um, so the, the major ones that you probably want to be aware of, 15th Street Stormwater Project, um, finishing up the stormwater work that we weren't able to complete last summer as um, we found out there were some failures in the course of doing the PMUF work. Um, <coughs> the big transportation ones this year is going to be High Street. Um, particularly South 2nd, um, or High Street from South 2nd all the way up to um, 3rd. So that will be a fairly impacted area. There'll be two projects going through there back to back. The first one will be a water main replacement. Um, and then once they finish the water main replacement, they'll do um, temporary pavement repair. They won't be doing a full blown pavement repair then PMUF will be coming in immediately behind them and reconstructing the road from South 2nd Street all the way to 3rd. 
Um, there's also some minor stormwater improvements that we're going to do in conjunction with that project. So um, you're, you're doing work on Tumwater? Um, we are doing work in Tumwater. I cannot recall. I think it's a two-inch mill and two-inch inlay Why? that we'll be doing through there. Why? Why Tumwater? Yeah. It's, um, it's still, in, in terms of pavement condition, it's, it's in poor condition. Um, we do get quite a few, quite a bit of traffic through there, a little bit more than you probably anticipate. Um, so it, it's, it's one of the areas where we, we wanted to get that off the list and then move on to um, other areas. Uh, the other big one that is going to be pretty impactful is part low. So part low, almost the full run of part low, um, we'll be getting some sort of pavement treatment through there. Most of it is a two inch mill, two inch inlay, but the big um, push on that is going to be a uh, new sidewalk coming in in sections, new curb, predominantly the curb will be on the west side. Um, so creating that pedestrian connectivity through there. There's some right of way acquisition that we're trying to finalize right now that'll finish up the, the right of way that we need to add the sidewalk through there. Um, the other big one I should probably mention is also on High Street in course of the Pima work that we're gonna do is um, doing some traffic calming in there. So we're gonna be doing some curb extensions. Um, one curb extension or a set of curbing sections at third, and then another set of curbing sections at first, and then consolidating some of the um, bus stops um, to take advantage of that um, traffic calming coming through there. Quick question about High Street. Is, is yeah. there a lot of rock in there, and are the oh, yeah. utility lines <laughs> in old rock uh, formations that were dug out many years ago in that? We found that there's quite a bit of rock through there. Um, the, the corings that we've gotten back so far indicate that we're going to have to include a, a, a value for rock punch um, okay. moving through those areas. It's not something that we think is insurmountable, but it's something we've, we've planned for and we'll try and address within um, the design plans. And then another thing that we're doing is taking advantage of some of the old utility trenches that are going through there for some of the utility work that we're doing to try and minimize that effort. So I mentioned there's some minor stormwater improvements we're gonna be doing through there. And that's taking advantage of an abandoned water line and reusing that for the stormwater one. So, um, let me think what are the other major ones. I think I'd probably, those are the big ones that um, I'll probably reference for, for this discussion. And then uh, of course there's some, uh, private projects that are referenced in here, including the Cove, um, the uh, recent um, annexation out there off of Holcomb, and then the improvements that'll be going on along um, the community college as well. So this document is gonna get posted on the public works page. So if you go to our public works page and you just click on the construction tab, um, all of these will be posted there for you to take a look at. And then also each of the individual capital projects has its own web page, and there's a reference for you there as well. We're also going to publish in the... Oh, and the um, Trail News um, uh, newsletter that we put out, um, this will be included. Um, this has now become a, an insert that we include in that every summer. Did you, I don't have a slide for the rock scaling project. Did I don't you? have an update on that, really. Okay. So they finished the, um, the tree removal. Um, so there's two parts of this project. So first part starts at um, the 99 tunnel and then comes out to um, just uh, south of the VFW, out by Stillhouse. And then the second part of it picks up just um, outside of the Kanema area and then moves um, south along 99. Um, first component of it, they basically loved our traffic control plan for um, Dana's water main replacement, and they plagiarized it. <laughs> um, we worked on it cooperatively with them so they they helped and we helped so um, they used it and then they basically came through removed all of the um, um, dense growth vegetation that had been coming up in in between the rock face and causing these little fissures and ruptures um, they took all of that out the next phase and again I don't have the construction date I wasn't able to check in with um, Caitlin um, is going to involve peeling back the wire mesh replacing sections of it where needed, um, anchoring in at new locations, and uh, kind of replacing that, uh, that entire um, 
rock fall protection than they have on uh, the section one is what they're calling it of the, the project. And that's it. Uh, uh, by the way, all these um, projects, except for the private development projects, are um, gas tax, pavement maintenance fees, utility fees, um, not property taxes. And I think at the last count, um, the number of ADA ramps that we're replacing this summer is high 60s. So we we actually on Thursday will be finishing the 90 percent plan review, um, but I think that's the last number that I have in my head was the high sixties in terms of ADA replacements. Um, I just put this one in here because we're scheduled to meet with Union Pacific and ODOT Rail and uh, a couple other kind of key stakeholders with property interests around that area to talk about um, development of a quiet zone. And one of the components to that is this little block that where we put in the uh, median. And so talking through that with um, what, what we're really hoping to get to, and it's one of the city commission's goals, is to get to an, a, a, a place or an improvement list that would allow the city to um, have what's called a railroad quiet zone that would minimize the amount of um, uh, horn, blow. would, horn blows, and I think it also affects speed. So just kind of rail noise that goes along with uh, having a track in your downtown. So um, I don't know exactly, but we've got, uh, I don't know exactly where we're gonna land in terms of improvements, but we've really got the 10th Street crossing and we've got a pedestrian crossing down uh, at 11th. And um, those are the two at-grade crossings that would have concerns uh, that I think the railroad and ODOT Rail would have concerns with you know, by not blowing horns. Mm. So they look pretty hard at signage. They're probably gonna look pretty hard at the existing um, oh, mast arms. arms that drop uh, to stop traffic. They, I think they wanna look at both sides of, of the railroad track. So going up Singer Hill as well, which is a little more challenging because there's not nearly as much space through there. And the grade changes are pretty su significant, but um, so yeah, what the intent is to get all the right folks on the ground and do what they call a diagnostics meeting. That's kind of the first step. So we'll be doing that in April. Is there any anything, any concern about 17th Street or like ensuring that the it's fences up all the time and cut off and so people don't cross there? Right, um, they may be interested in that. Um, right now we've talked about just the two, um, so, yeah. What's the speed limit now, uh, John, through, through the city? Does it vary, or is so it- the rail line? It? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, in the application that I did for this, we asked them to provide that for us, and the number I got was 79, which surprised yep. me. I 79 don't think it's, miles an hour? I don't think it's going that fast. I, I think yeah, the track may be rated for that, but I don't think they, Come through at that speed. I, I think it has more to do with the fact that they generally don't have speed limits on the trains, and the feds, federal government says that on normal train track, 79 miles an hour is the maximum anywhere in the United States. Yeah, I, 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 I question that, but it was a number that they shared, so I, I don't, you know, my senses are not. It feels really fast coming through if you're standing next to it or if you're parked in front of it, but um, I really don't believe that's no. uh, more than probably 35 miles an hour. When, I, when I've been pacing them, it's more like 40 or 45. Yeah. Okay, so that's that. And then uh, I guess I'm out of slides, but I wanted to share, because I didn't make a, I didn't have a graphic for this, but we talked a little bit about safe routes to school and um, Clackamas County is having a countywide meeting on safe routes to school. And I would, um, I don't think I can attend. Uh, I'm hoping Dana can attend 
or maybe Martin can attend. I haven't asked him yet, but um, I just got word of this. So March 20th, from 3.30 to 5.30, they're having a this countywide meeting. Today? Today. Um, oh, shoot, yeah, that's today. I can't make it, John. Can't make it. We probably won't make it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I hope Dana got to that because uh, that was that would have been a good meeting to get to. I knew I couldn't get to it, so um, yeah, somehow I was off by a month. I was thinking that was April twentieth, but so um, I guess that's a little late. Sorry. So still an interest, right? I mean, that's where a lot of funding is going to be available if we talk about grant applications is through Safe Routes to School. And so far, we haven't gotten the school district to. Oh, uh, I went kind of to the Oregon <clears throat> City. Well, Holcomb made talked to principal, but I need to follow up. I'm going to try to set up coffee or something and go chat with her about it. See what she. Found out she was supposed to talk to the uh, school district and then get back to me, but she hasn't. So. All right. Well, let us know if we can help. We can buy coffee or do whatever. Martin or I could either handle that. And, um, Dana, so if, if that would help facilitate that, we'd be happy to do that. That's all I have. Do you, am I missing something? Do you have a TPAC memo tacked under the back of the agenda packet? Do I have a, a what? Uh, There's a memo. Transportation here. Policy Alternative Committee, TPAC. Oh. Memo Friday, October 19, 2017. It's got timelines and And talked about JPAC and the thing that was interesting was that uh, this one, Tom, the Metro one. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't have a picture like that on the front of mine. Mine starts out. It just says memo, date Friday, October 19, 2017, to TPAC. Okay. Yeah. Party. Yeah. That's an informational piece for you. That that was that. Um, enhanced transit project right. that we talked a little bit about. So, so I'm on page uh, three of that. So on your agenda, under 6A communications, this is the information that's concluded, included with that. This is just informational items that are for you. They weren't necessarily intended for discussion. I can wait that for it looked like there was some meeting opportunities at the county level and we were having input as all local jurisdictions were in the county input into I guess what we thought our transportation needs might be you know through public transportation so do we have some representatives there and all that right so um, Dana met with TriMet and they did a um, they did kind of their safety audit of that 33 line okay. where we where we talked to them specifically about High Street and 5th Street and the bus stops in that area. They 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 were also interested in the Main Street stops, mm -hmm. but we're really not um, in a position to eliminate any of those stops and we don't they're during peak hours um, you know, obviously the congestion's pretty heavy. So their interest is trying to improve service by looking for efficiencies. Yeah. And so th that that line in particular is one that they spent a lot of time looking at. They also looked at it along 99E as it crosses into Oregon City from Gladstone. Mm -hmm. So that was the January workshop that um, that uh, uh, Dana attended. Is that what you're... Yeah, so that connects it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Item seven, future agenda items. Does anybody have anything they want to put on future agendas? Okay. 
Lisa, could you uh, maybe send us all a list of the items that we have on the future agenda items, or is it a very long list? Um, I'll put it together for you. I don't think it's very long. Okay. Lisa, um, just, Lisa just reminded me a couple things. Um, so the Oregon City Chamber, who our bylaws um, indicate should have a representative member on this committee, has made a recommendation to the mayor and, um, as I understand it, on maybe tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. Yeah, he's going he's gonna to go ahead and make that recommendation. So the next TAC meeting, we will have, um, and I've forgotten his name. Or is Vance it Tong. Vance Tong? Mm -hmm. Okay. I see Mr. Tong. Yep. You know, I saw that on the agenda, and I thought, well, I don't remember us doing any interviews. Mm -hmm. no. And then I remembered it's a Chamber of Commerce representative. Right. Mm -hmm. And he should, he, he should be good. So I think he's a staff editor at the, for the Pamplin Media Group. So he'll probably have some awareness of what's going on in the area. Going to get rid of, huh? Mm -hmm. What's that? <laughs> We're going to get rid up, rid up? I don't know. If he's, <laughs> I don't know if he's willing to offer those free services for you or not, but maybe. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be good press, not bad. <laughs> And then um, the other thing is we had talked about um, providing some light dinner here um, for the members before our TAC meeting. So our TAC meetings are always at 6, so I don't know, 5.30 or so, we'd have something here that would help you get through the meeting a little bit, uh, le or maybe a little bit less, you know, grouchy. <laughs> we'll sweeten you up Grouchy. a little bit. <laughs> for each meeting, correct? So I think for each Moving for each on. meeting, yeah. That yeah. Assessment of our right. No, that'd be great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. I could have had a VA. <laughs> <laughs> anything else? Anybody have anything else for the group? This meeting is adjourned.